We now begin uh, the hearing in the case of Al Alberta Spruill. My name is Rhea Julian, and I'm the rapporteur for this hearing. Presiding over this hearing today is Commissioner Max Bakwana of South Africa and Commissioner Peter Herbert of uh, the UK and Kenya. The witness uh, for this hearing is the attorney for the estate of Alberta Spruill. That is uh, Mr. Derek Sells of the Cochrane Law Firm. Uh, there will be 50 minutes for this hearing. Witnesses, the witness will testify, followed by a period of questioning uh, from the commissioners. I will call time at the 30 minute mark and at the 45 minute mark, please excuse my interruptions. Commissioners Bakwana and Herbert, I now present to you your first witness, Derek Sells. Um, Mr. Derek Sells, please confirm your name. Yes, it's Derek Sells. Uh, do you promise that your testimony to the Commission of Inquiry will be true to the best of your knowledge and belief? I do. You may begin. Hey, thank you. Uh, and good morning, commissioners, uh, you. fellow panelists. Uh, I am very privileged and proud to be here um, speaking to you today um, about my client, Al Alberta Spruill, the late Alberta Spruill. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a background. Um, before I get into the facts uh, of the case, but this is a case that that um, I work with uh, with uh, the late Johnny Cochran Jr. Um, of the of the Cochran firm, and so um, I was very honored and, and proud to to stand with him, who was a great um, civil rights champion, someone who cared about uh, people very very deeply. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the background. Um, back in 2003, because this was a, a while ago. This was before, you know, we had cell phone uh, videos of police brutality. This was a, a, at a time um, before there were body worn cameras, and so we we had to, you know, prosecute then uh, these these types of cases much differently, um, where we had to try and overcome certain um, prejudices that people held uh, towards police, where the police, you know, back then, their word was, was not um, as questioned as it is today, by, at least by some. And so um, that brings us to New York City, 2003, and the type of policing that was going on then. Um, Michael Bloomberg was, was the mayor, and um, there was a commissioner, Ray Kelly, who implemented a, a series of, um, of police tactics known as uh, stop and frisk and broken windows policing, where individuals um, who were black and brown primarily would be stopped for no reason at all, frisked, questioned, and if some minor uh, crime was uh, found or if there was probable cause for some minor crime, then people would be arrested, uh, mainly in black and brown communities, with the hope that with these low level arrests, that individuals would be able to then provide information um, to lead to other arrests of maybe more um, substance. Um, this was a, you know, a practice that that came into focus when, when Bloomberg uh, decided that he was gonna run um, as a Democrat in the, in the recent uh, presidential uh, Democratic primary. Um, and he came under fire for, for, uh, for these policies. And um, the Alberta Spruill case is a perfect example of why. Um, going back to uh, December, of 2002, December 27th of 2002, there was an individual whose name has never been revealed, but who was arrested on a minor trespassing offense. Um, he was uh, stopped by police, questioned, he was frisked, and they found a, a small amount of narcotics on him. He was uh, charged, arrested with criminal trespass and possession of some uh, narcotics. Um, and he was given an opportunity to get a, a reduced sentence and a favorable plea 
if he would simply provide information about um, higher level drug dealing that was going on. And so this individual quickly took the opportunity. Um, he was allowed to, to plead guilty simply to a, a simple trespass. And he was given time served, which um, amounted to 12 hours uh, in detention. Following that, um, he went to uh, the 28th precinct, which is a police precinct in Manhattan, where he was going to provide information. Uh, he was given uh, three dates in January of 2003 to meet with uh, the officers in the 28th precinct, detectives in the 28th precinct to give the information that he was required to give. And he failed to show up. Again, uh, the next month in February of 2003, uh, he was given three other dates uh, where he was supposed to show up in the 28th precinct. Um, and again, without explanation or justification, he failed to show up. And so having missed six appointments uh, without explanation, he was deemed unreliable. And he was decertified as um, a police informant. The police um, in the 28th precinct, however, did not put this information into uh, the system, whatever the system was back then, that would alert other police precincts that this individual was no longer a certified um, confidential informant because he was deemed unreliable. Um, the 28th precinct turned away this informant the next time that he uh, tried to make contact with them. So he instead went to another Manhattan-based precinct uh, the 25th precinct, where they accepted him with open arms, not knowing, not caring about the fact that he had been decertified and deemed unreliable. And in late April, early May of 2003, um, detectives from the 25th precinct met with this individual and got information from him that they determined um, was reliable. How they determined it was reliable, I'm not sure, because they did nothing to ensure that the information he gave them was reliable. This information that he gave um, was that there was an individual named Melvin Boswell who was heavily armed and was a drug dealer. Someone who was dealing drugs out of uh, apartment 6F at 310 West 143rd Street, and that he was an armed and dangerous uh, individual, and that they should do something about it, essentially. Now, the police, they didn't try and locate Melvin Boswell in their system. Um, they didn't check to see who lived at apartment 6F at 310 West 143rd Street. Instead, they went to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and they got uh, a district attorney there to um, have this unreliable confidential informant fill out uh, a warrant. Uh, uh, what's called a no-knock warrant to get into apartment 6F of 310 West 143rd Street. Now, just to give you some legal background um, with regard to the Fourth Amendment and in New York, um, police are allowed to conduct searches of individuals' homes provided that they are able to uh, show probable cause, meaning that there's some basis, some legal basis to believe that criminal activity has taken place um, in a particular place, a particular home. Um, a, a judge is then provided with this affidavit 
Um, and if the judge is satisfied uh, with the affidavit, then the judge will sign it. And it gives um, a legal basis for police to then enter a home and, and conduct a search. Most searches um, are required to be done with what's called a um, knock uh, and announce, which means that with armed with a legal um, search warrant, police go to a home and they knock on the door and they announce their purpose. Um, in order to get a no-knock warrant, um, the police and prosecutors are required to show the additional proof that not only was uh, their probable cause, but also that the individual who, whose uh, place it is that, that they wanted to search um, presented a danger such that by knocking and announcing their presence, um, it, would, it would put the lives of the officers um, in jeopardy. Um, and so with this unreliable confidential informant, the police and the prosecutors went to uh, a judge in Manhattan. They had the, uh, the, this unreliable uh, person uh, swear on an affidavit to the effect that uh, Melvin Boswell uh, resided in you know, this apartment, 6F, 310 West 143rd Street, and that he would be um, someone who was armed and dangerous and would therefore um, require that this be a no-knock warrant. The judge signed off on it. Um, now, had the prosecutors, had the police done just a simple check, they would have realized that living at 310 West 143rd Street, apartment 6F, was my client, Alberta Sproul, a 57-year-old woman with a heart condition, someone who had worked her whole professional life for the city of New York in their administration uh, services unit. She's someone who lived alone, someone who was law-abiding, someone who had no connection to any illegal activity, let alone drugs and guns. Had they done another simple check on Melvin Boswell, they had checked their own records. They would have learned that Melvin Boswell was in prison that he was incarcerated for months before this unreliable informant told them his name and the false address of where he lived. Melvin Boswell was put in jail by the same prosecutors that asked this judge to swear out um, or to sign a search warrant, uh, a no-knock search warrant. The police, the NYPD were the same police that arrested and incarcerated Melvin Boswell. And so at the time that this all happened, Alberta Sproul lived in the apartment that the police were gonna then enter with a no-knock warrant and Melvin Boswell was locked up. He was, he was not in possession of any guns or drugs. Um, but in any event, the judge signed off on the warrant. Uh, the police on May 16th, 2003 at a little past 6 a.m. broke into Ms. Sproul's apartment. They knocked the door off its hinges. They threw in a stun grenade, which is uh, a percussion grenade so that it makes a loud flash and a bang. They sometimes they're called flashbang grenades. Uh, Miss Sproul at the time was getting prepared to go to work. Um, she rode um, the same bus to work uh, every morning. She was getting prepared for that when the police came busting through. And these police officers were armed to the teeth. They um, 
did not announce their presence. They simply kicked her door in, threw in a flash grenade, came busting in with their guns drawn. Miss Spruill was thrown to the floor. She was violently handcuffed, so violently handcuffed that in the autopsy that followed um, her death, um, it was shown that blood vessels had burst in her shoulders. Miss Spruill was knocked to the ground. And um, when the police went in, instead of finding some drug den, what they found was a neat, tidy apartment of an older woman who lived alone. When they realized, by the time they realized their mistake, Miss Spruill was in pain. She could not catch her breath. She was frightened. The police then got EMS to come to the scene. She was taken to the hospital. And 20 minutes later, she was pronounced dead from cardiac arrest. The autopsy that followed indicated that her death uh, was caused by a police raid, including the flashbang stun grenades, as well as being thrown to the floor. It, over, it overcame her and affected her heart such that it stopped and she died at 57 years old. And so following her death, um, you know, I, 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 along with, uh, with Johnny Cochran, met with, with her family. Um, she had a son. Uh, she had two sisters. Um, and we brought a case against the city of New York, uh, the police department, as well as the, uh, the office of uh, the Manhattan district attorney for their gross failures in this case. Uh, we allege that her constitutional rights were violated, as well as the fact that there was uh, negligence on the part of both the DA's office and the city's police department in the way that they conducted this raid and in the way that um, they killed Ms. Brewer. And it, in terms of the racial aspect to this case, um, it's very clear that had Mr. Boswell, uh, I'm sorry, had the confidential informant uh, not pinpointed a Mr. Boswell who lived in um, you know, a New York City housing complex, but instead he pointed to a rich uh, white person who lived in the Carhartt mansion in the Upper West Side of New York that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and the Police Department would have certainly done a much more thorough background check before they came busting in through the door and throwing flashbang grenades. And so this was clearly a case, in our view, where race played a significant role in the misconduct that occurred Race played a role in the stop and frisk of this confidential informant that initiated the conduct that led to Ms. Rule's death. Race played a role in the fact that uh, the police did not do any background check or the prosecutors did not do any background check on the validity, not only of the confidential informant, but also of the location where they were going to go in without knocking and announcing. And so as a result, um, an innocent African-American woman who worked for the same city that the prosecutors and the police department um, folks work for ended up dead. And so with that, um, I'm willing to answer any questions 
uh, that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Sells, uh, for your testimony. I'd like to turn it over to the commissioners now. Max, would you like to, to go first? Yes, thank, thank you very much, Peter. And, and, and thanks, Derek, for, for that concise uh, presentation. And, and is it your view that if in reality, uh, poverty and racial segregation, and in this instance, racial profiling, is the main driver that led to the death of, um, of Ms. Prey. Because it's quite, it's quite interesting that this case, different from other cases, gives a different perspective where mainly the police brutality is meted out against um, young male African-Americans, where it's very easy to say they were threatening violence against the police or they are running um, a criminal syndicate, et cetera. But this one, it's a very different one. There's no ways that this woman was posing any danger to them. So, so my real question is that this is, in your view, is this a classical case of racial profiling compounded by the poverty status okay. and segregated status of okay. um, African-Americans? Well, you ask a very good uh, question, uh, Commissioner. Um, I do believe it. It has. It is. It's. It, it is nuanced. Only. Only because when the police finally got into the apartment, don't pull. They realized their mistake. But what they. What they. What the profiling was. Initially, um, the the. Confidential informant was racially profiled. He was stopped and frisked. So that was one aspect that led to what ultimately happened. The next, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a, a, a racial profiling, but it's just the, the, the belief that is rooted in so many law enforcement personnel that when you're talking about an African-American uh, male which in this case happened to be someone by the name of Melvin Boswell, um, it's, like, it's like it's just assumed that it's true. It's assumed that it's true. And so that there was no, absolutely no investigation to confirm the truth of it. It was just mm -hmm. believed. And so when the police went into Ms. Sproul's apartment, they didn't go in there thinking that they were gonna see Miss Sproul, they didn't think they were going to see a 57-year-old um, single woman. What they believed was that they were going to confront an African-American stereotypical, you know, drug-dealing, gun-slinging male. And that's what they went prepared to do. And so when Miss Sproul happened to be there, she was treated as if she was part of his crew and she was thrown to the ground. She was violently handcuffed even before they could figure out what really was going on. And so, yes, even though the ultimate victim in this case was a 57 year old African-American woman, the target was an individual, a stereotypical individual who um, the police believed was a black male gunslinging drug dealer. And the fact that he was in jail already did not matter because they believed what the narrative was, black male gunslinging drug dealer. So I hope I've answered your question, but I don't see any difference um, other than the fact that at the end of the day, uh, the police were mistaken in their belief that they were dealing with an African-American male. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just be Before I ask my uh, question, Mr. Sells, you, I think you will probably know that um, Johnny Cochran, the late Johnny Cochran and uh, his, his firm, 
came to the United Kingdom in uh, the summer of 1995 and made an enormous contribution in the Race for Justice conference where we paralleled and raised together with Milton Grimes, the National Bar Association, many of the issues that you're currently talking about this evening, very tragic issues. And then actually, um, at the end of the O.J. Simpson trial, he went to meet Nelson Mandela. And yeah. that was, I think, the first occasion after those 12 months uh, as being an international, um, one of the most and probably the most well-renowned um, legal brain and advocate in the world. He went in to have that those discussions with Nelson Mandela. So I think I just wanted to draw that link, drawing back on that history from 1995. And I obviously commend your firm as well and yourself for the brilliant work that you're doing. That, that having been said, the, 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 the question I wanted to, to pose is, is this, is that these circumstances are almost exactly parallel throughout the Pan-African diaspora. About a year ago, we got a call from a family in East London, in Islington, where the former Prime Minister Tony Blair used to live. And there was a very similar raid committed by British police officers, Metropolitan Police officers, where there was an 81-year-old woman who had a door kicked in on the basis of wrongful information from a black informer, completely bogus that it was a, a place where, which was selling in hard drugs, cocaine, heroin, and the like, that they may expect some armed resistance. And exactly apart from the stun grenade, the same scenario uh, took place. The lady had a heart attack. She survived, luckily enough. Her daughter, who was also in the premises, was a Church of England minister. Uh, and so the, wherever we have our diaspora, we have the same appalling levels of incompetence and racism. And certainly when we, we met the family, we knew that there would have been double, triple, treble checks if they thought for, the, for one minute that this person was white. And it was as stark as that. And I wanted to ask you this follow-up question. Given that um, synergy, uh, for want of a better word, between what happens to our diaspora all over the world and stepping back for a moment, is it not really time that whether it's in Canada or Brazil or the United Kingdom or Germany or France or Spain or Italy, where exactly the same things occur, we really need to internationalize this uh, debate, our learning, our policies, and hold these governments to the highest possible international standards so that they do not escape, in a sense, behind the, 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 the latest right-wing violence or supposed terrorist attack from the Middle East um, and bury this in, in the good news that they supposedly tell us about that we're experiencing from time to time. I just wanted to have your view on that. And, and, and secondly, in relation to the question I raised earlier in the week, is there not a possibility now and should there not be something canvassed to be able to have private prosecutions mounted of police officers and law enforcement? Because for, for me, there is, if the system fails in the United States, if the attorney general, if the district attorney decides not to prosecute, you've got nowhere to go but a claim for damages. And, and just viewed from over the water, it seems a real lacuna in the law in the US. And I'm not saying the law in the United Kingdom is perfect by any means, but at least sometimes citizens, whether it's a, domestic, a DV case or an assault, we can mount a private prosecution. If the state fails, we do it ourselves. Great. Now, you raised a couple of very, very important points, uh, Commissioner. And, you know, with regard to your first point, um, absolutely. I believe that police misconduct, law enforcement misconduct has to be addressed um, on a global level as well as on a local level. Um, and I think that um, in order for policing to change, um, there must be a, a much pressure mounted on um, on those officers who commit wrongs against individuals as possible. And if it comes from uh, you know, an international uh, tribunal, whether it comes from a local tribunal, something needs to happen in order for this to change. Now what, the, 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 the second question that you, you pose about you know, how to hold um, law enforcement uh, officers as well as prosecutors 
um, who violate people's rights, how to hold them accountable is an important question. Right now, prosecutors are shielded, as well as, as law enforcement officers, that they're shielded by, um, by various immunities. Uh, that, at least in, in the United States, there's qualified immunity, which is a defense that is raised often by police officers, um, especially where they are essentially um, allowed to violate people's rights as long as they believe that their actions are um, otherwise justified and, and not unconstitutional. So in a situation like this, where the police officers who executed the warrant weren't the ones that secured the warrant, they weren't the ones that went to the judge, their actions were essentially, you know, could, could be justified from a legal standpoint because arguably they acted with the belief that they were going into a dangerous situation. And so the, the steps that they took um, would be protected legally. Um, and it would be for the, the prosecutor and whoever the you know, police officer was that, that secured the warrant and didn't check to see whether or not it was accurate or reliable, um, they would be the ones who really would have the finger um, and should have the finger pointed at them. But under our system right now, other than the, the lawsuit that we brought, there's no way to hold them accountable. Um, again, because they're shielded by, um, by immunity in terms of uh, any type of criminal um, charges being leveled against them. Uh, even though this, in, in my view, um, amounts to gross uh, and utter negligence, there's nothing more that can be done other than for them to be sued. Um, and so how do, we, how do we address that? How do we make it so that police officers and prosecutors who um, are in a similar situation, how do we make sure that they will actually do the work that they're required to do in order to protect people's lives. My response to that is that we have to hold them financially responsible, that where there is a violation of rights, that it shouldn't be just on the taxpayers to pay for the damages that they cause. Um, you know, there's, there's this whole thing, this whole blue wall of silence that, that, you know, they call it the thin blue line, the blue wall of silence, where police officers and law enforcement and prosecutors, they stick together to try and protect themselves from harm when they do wrong. And even though there's probably only like, you know, a handful of really bad apples out there, what corrupts the police department is the fact that he, these police officers, these, these, these bad apples are all known throughout the uh, department. And the other officers who otherwise would be considered decent law-abiding officers, they pull themselves down into the muck because they do not speak out. They do not reveal the harms that these bad apples do. Instead, they're shamed by their police unions and others. They're shamed into um, you know, towing the line and protecting the, those that commit wrongs. And we need to change that. And I think one of the ways that we can do that is by making um, you know, law enforcement responsible for paying for the damages that they cause. You know, there's a big police pension fund, a huge one here in New York where you know, police officers, they, they pay into it. You know, the unions, they, they have all these pension funds that are, that are enormous. And if there was some way that um, where there was a police wrong that was done and you know the police officer or what have you was found to be responsible for some uh, violation of a, of a person's rights then it should you know it should come out of the police pension fund and unless there's another officer who steps up and says you know what he's the one that did it it was a wrong if they come you know and they reveal it before it gets to this point then maybe you know there could be some way to 
to shield the, the fund, but there has to be some financial incentive, in my view, to require um, that that would um, that would compel police officers to do the right thing, number one. And if they don't do the right thing, then there should be a motivation for those officers that witness the wrong to come forward. Um, right now, there is no such mechanism. And police officers are not held really um, responsible for paying uh, for their own harms, at least not in New York. Um, you know, there's a deal between the police unions and the city of New York that police officers who do wrong um, can be indemnified by the city of New York, by the taxpayers uh, for their own, for their unconstitutional acts. Um, and that's good in one sense because, you know, it allows for those uh, victims of police misconduct to, to, be, um, to be compensated, but it does not serve uh, the purpose of motivating police officers to do the right thing. And so I think that there has to be some type of financial component um, that would compel uh, officers to do the right thing. Thank you. I, I would just like to call time so far. It's uh, 1037 at this point. We have 23, uh, rather we have 13 minutes left in the hearing. Thanks, Ria. Derek, thank you very much for your, your clear explanation. I, I just want to check who must hold this police accountable and why up until this stage um, that is not happening. Aren't we here dealing with a systemic problem, um, which is a, a poisonous coalition between the political system, the judiciary, and the prosecutorial system? And in this instance, beyond the individual police, but to include the unions, so that they all pro provide the cover that will make sure that these police um, have no incentive of doing the right thing. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, the system is, um, it's, it's, that's the way that the system actually operates, right? It's, you know, we, we look at it, like um, if you look at the system and, and I'm talking about here in New York and I guess in, in most other places, um, you know, it's supposed to operate um, separately. Like you're supposed to have the judiciary, right? The judges, then you're supposed to have the prosecutors, then you're supposed to have the police officers. They're all supposed to be independent and not, you know, working, working together. But in practice, what happens is that, you know, the same prosecutors see the same judges who see the same police officers on a daily basis. And as a result, this, this familiarity occurs where, you know, it's no longer, you know, an independent operating um, system. You know, it's all interconnected. The judges rely upon the prosecutors um, to keep their case uh, the, their case levels manageable. They rely on the prosecutors so that they don't have to be overworked. Um, the prosecutors have to rely on the police officers so that they can get the paperwork done, so that they can get the hearings done, so that the, the police officers can be witnesses, they can bring in witnesses. And so there's this whole system where they become very familiar with one another and they become codependent on one another. And so when one you know, is charged or possibly charged with looking at the conduct of another, for example, where a police officer is alleged to have committed some type of crime, and it's incumbent upon the prosecutor to review the facts that um, surround that potential crime, you know, there's going to be a blind eye turn in, often, in, in, in many cases, where the police officer is not going to not going to face charges simply because they're familiar to the prosecutors. Oh, he's a good guy. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, I don't believe that witness. I'm not going to believe that witness. We're not going to charge this police officer. Similarly, if there's misconduct on the part of a prosecutor that's brought to the attention of a judge, the judge is going to be, you know, hesitant to, to take it to the next level. Because oftentimes in, in cases where there's attorney misconduct alleged, it's incumbent upon a judge to review 
that allegation of misconduct. Um, and so I think that part of it has to change. There needs to be an independent body, an independent prosecutorial body that will go after um, misbehaving prosecutors, misbehaving police officers. And in cases where the judge is involved, misbehaving judges so that we can be assured that um, there will be a neutral body to evaluate those claims of misconduct. And I think if we can get to that point and we take it seriously enough so that we go after the people that are in law enforcement, then we can have a cultural change um, in that regard. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask, and I'm not sure if, if you, you have the answer off the top of your head, but are there any statistics which appear on the scale or lack of it of involvement of African-American police officers themselves? I know that some were at the scene with Eric Garner. I know that there were um, some officers of color that were responsible in the cases that we've heard. But what I don't have is an, an overall picture of to what extent the presence or otherwise of African-Americans within police forces has had a beneficial effect, either none at all or only marginal effect, uh, given the statistics either in California or in the U.S. as a whole. Yeah, that's a good question, Commissioner. Um, I, you know, I don't know what the statistics are, but I think what you're touching upon is a very important point. And I think the point that you're touching upon is is something that, that um, I refer to and it's commonly referred to as community policing, right? So community policing has a definition in New York where um, the police officers who um, are assigned to a particular community um, are supposed to live in that community, right? And so it could be that, you know, if there's a police officer who is assigned to um, patrol, let's say in the Bronx, New York, then that officer is required to, to live in the county of the, of, of, the, of the Bronx. Now, I have a problem with that definition of community policing, because it could be that that police officer who's assigned to live, you know, and, and uh, patrol the Bronx, he might've come from, you know, a community out in Long Island somewhere um, where you know you might have a white police officer assigned to a predominantly black community in the Bronx or Hispanic community in the Bronx. But simply by moving him from let's say Suffolk County and placing him in the Bronx is not gonna make him more familiar with the people from the Bronx that he's assigned to patrol. What I would prefer is I think what you're talking about, where if you want to have a better protection of civilians from police brutality, then you need to have police officers who actually grew up and lived in the community that they are now asked to patrol. If you have um, an individual, let's say, who is from you know, a particular um, housing project, let's say in th that they're supposed to um, patrol in the Bronx and you actually recruit individuals as a, you know, if the NYPD actually recruited individuals from that housing project and made them police officers for that housing project, then we would have a lot better and safer um, interaction between police and the community. I say that because if the police officer who is um, going to police his own community, if they know the individuals and they've grown up with them, then they have a better um, way of, of being able to de-escalate situations. If they know an individual who let's say is having a bad day as opposed to who is just you know completely violent, then they would have a better way of talking and communicating with that individual and not have to resort to, you know, a use of force, a gun or, uh, 
you know, a taser or what have you, because they know the individual and they know how to, how to you know, de-escalate or they might know what, what's going on with the individual. So I think if we were able to do that, um, where we could get more police officers from the community in which they live to police their own community, then we would, we would have a much safer system. Charles, we just have uh, three minutes remaining in the hearing if there is a final question from the commissioners. I, I think he, he has covered it uh, properly unless Peter has got the last question. Um, no, I, I, I think the, what I, in a sense, would, would like to see, if it's feasible, is a national U.S. database kept by civil society of police officers who are guilty of misconduct, uh, that that be shared and posted. And I hear the difficulties that might bring about uh, legal action, but that can be outsourced. I mean, there, there must be a way that if the government of the United States will not protect the, our communities and will allow police officers to act with impunity, then the international uh, progressive and pan-African community must be able to highlight those pe people on a database and hold them to account. And I, I, that, especially with the power of social media, I don't think is beyond the, the realms of... of uh, our technical ability within our communities all over the world. Whether they're Brazilian or whether they're in the United Kingdom or Germany or S Sweden or France, the stories are dreadfully similar. Um, and clearly, yes, the United States and maybe Brazil has the largest number of killings. Um, but really, the, this should be these days, their faces should be on some gallery, rogues gallery, if you like. Uh, and that's what I would dearly like to see, even if that is uh, takes a year or two to organize, but it must be done. Well, you, you raise a great point, and I, I, I'm so lucky. Um, my wife, uh, Mina Malik, uh, she used to be the head of the CCRB here in New York. She was uh, the, the head of the CCRB. And one of the things that she implemented while she was there was a data transparency initiative where um, she kept the database. She wanted to keep a database of, uh, of just what you're talking about, you know, so that, so that it would be transparent what officers have had the most um, allegations against them and thereby allowing for, you know, a red flag to show up where, you know, the same officers keep coming up with the same charges. And so even if it's a situation where, you know, an officer has been exonerated from certain, you know, charges, whether it be because a, a witness was intimidated and didn't come forward or because a witness you know, at some point did not follow through with what was required, um, that, the, that the allegations against the officer would trigger a red flag so that you would know who the bad apples are. And um, I think that is something that could be done locally. And then the local information could be shared um, in, a, in a more global fashion. And I think we could achieve what it is that you're talking about. Thank you, Mr. Sells. This concludes the hearing in the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sells. All right. This concludes the hearing in the case of Alberta Sproul's. Sproul. Uh, we will now have a short break. Hearings will resume on the hour with the case of Jason Harrison. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>